welcome you to uh, Bristol Community College. Um, this afternoon's uh, presentation, um, I'm Herb Tracy, director of the Teaching American History program, and Katie Mello, who is the program secretary. And on behalf of the um, Teaching American History program, I have to welcome here this afternoon. Um, a little bit of background, the Teaching American History program um, has been providing professional development opportunities for elementary and secondary teachers here in the, in the region for uh, a number of years. Um, and what we provide for teachers is workshops, summer institutes, as well as lectures such as this um, on afternoons, and it's open to uh, the general public. And um, this afternoon, this is our second in the series of presentations that we'll have. Uh, our next one is on April 14th, and that's immigration, what to use immigration to Fall River. And in May, and this will all be up on our website, we have a presentation by Dr. James Lowen, who's the author of Lies My Teacher Told Me. We have information on those lectures over on the side. Um, it is my pleasure this afternoon to uh, introduce President Jack Sprague, who is a historian in his own right and um, who has taken time out of his very busy schedule to introduce our guest speaker this afternoon. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce President Sprague. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone. We're very excited about our uh, visiting lecturer today. and. Uh, been a while since we uh, revisited the uh, Seneca Falls and some of the great uh, events and uh, landmark uh, occasions in the women's history and American history. Uh, I, uh, uh, it's a pleasure. I want to uh, clear my schedule to be sure to uh, be here. Uh, I can't stay too long, but I'll stay for a little while. Uh, uh, Professor Walsh is a historical sociologist uh, who teaches in the Writing and Women's uh, Gender Studies program at MIT. And this is her first uh, trip to uh, uh, to BCC, but but she has Fall River roots that she might talk about later. Her teaching and research interests center on gender and social justice movements as well as the media culture in the United States. And so maybe we can have her back at other times to talk about some of those other projects. Her publications include Women's Film and Fem Female Experience, 1940 to 1950 in various articles on gender and uh, visual media. Uh, currently, she's researching the first wave of American women's rights activism uh, from about mid-century and the 19th century up to the 1920s, and the vote, okay, uh, uh, with a focus on the everyday uh, justice practices of mid-19th century female and male American uh, women's rights activists who were involved in dress reform, marriage reform, and holistic health practices. Uh, I'm not sure if prohibition was in on all that as well. Or not, you know, like saloon, anti saloon league. But uh, it, it really is a pleasure uh, uh, for us to uh, to have this whole program. And uh, you know, the uh, the funding is always problematic. Uh, uh, but uh, what a great what a great program we've had. Outstanding historians, of which today we have yet another one. So please join me to welcome uh, Dr. Andrea Blum. Thank you, Professor Walsh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Herb and uh, President Strega. Um, I want to uh, talk today about the Seneca Falls Convention and specifically the Declaration of Sentiments and Resolutions, which I think each of you should receive a copy of. Uh, many historians evoke the power of place in dating the birth of the first wave of American women's rights activism to July 19th to 20th, 1848, in Seneca Falls, New York. This is now a national historical park. Before we move into the pathways to and from the Seneca Falls Convention, I want to give you a taste of the convention by playing a very short segment from a documentary film entitled One Woman, One Vote. This begins in a suffrage parade in the 19-teens, and then it will take you back to Seneca Falls and then we'll discuss what made Seneca Falls possible. Seneca Falls is actually organized in a period of about 10 days 
by five women. And this appears, when you first learn this fact, uh, to be very astonishing. But when you look at the political pathways to Seneca Falls and from Seneca Falls, it's actually not so astonishing. So first, a uh, short clip from one woman, one vote. Washington had never seen anything like it. Eight thousand women from all over the country flooding down Pennsylvania Avenue demanding the right to vote. It is absurd, said one delegate. Half the citizens in America keeping the other half from the ballot. dressed as pilgrims, had marched 400 miles from New York City, led by General Rosalie Jones. We are marching on to victory, coming in our lives, for our cause is right. We are marching for The reaction from the crowd was mixed. Some men jeered. One yelled, go home to your mother. The marcher yelled back, my mother is here. Women new to the battle, some who had fought for decades. By 1913, the movement had millions of supporters. But on that blustering day, there were few who could remember how it all began, 65 years before, in Seneca Falls, New York. In 1848, this was a progressive town in the heart of the anti-slavery movement. But the women of Seneca Falls were as confined as any in the land. Second-class citizens restricted by law and custom. Once a woman married, everything that she owned became her husband's. They ceased to exist legally. Women had no rights to their own property. They had no rights to their children. They had no rights to the safety of their own bodies. One of the states upheld the right of a husband to beat his wife, saying that to do otherwise would be to upset the domestic harmony of the home. Those who dared suggest that women were entitled to equal rights were accused of blasphemy. It was in this climate that the first woman's rights meeting was called at a modest chapel in Seneca Falls. The leader, 32-year-old Elizabeth Cady Stanton, did not look like a revolutionary, but Stanton had been a rebel since childhood. A judge's daughter, she had fought for an education as good as her brother's. Now the wife of a radical abolitionist, Stanton was pushing the fight beyond slavery to demand justice for women as well. The history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries on the part of man toward woman, having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. For two days, the Methodist chapel rang with the voices of 300 women and 40 men 
most of them abolitionists already calling for the end of slavery. Now they raise some of the most troubling issues to women. Divorce, education, property rights, passing one resolution after the next. Then the assembly was thrown into an uproar by Stanton's demand that women be given the right to vote. For what shall we first petition? For the exercise of our right to the elective franchise. Nothing short of this. The grant of this right will secure all the others. That was the only thing that was controversial among them. It was so radical. It was such a quintessentially male act by 1848 to vote that they really had to argue among themselves about whether it was okay to put that in, whether that would sink the whole thing. Women couldn't by law vote, but by and large what was at stake here wasn't just law, it was a whole set of customs and assumptions about the way the world was supposed to be, about what men and women were, women were supposed to be. It was only men, mostly white men, who had the right to vote. The debate over woman's suffrage went on for hours until abolitionist Frederick Douglass rose in support. This cause is not exclusively woman's cause. It is the cause of human brotherhood as well as human sisterhood. The Seneca Falls Declaration called for the vote in a true democracy where male and female, black and white, would stand together on equal ground. Reaction to the convention was swift. One paper called it an insurrection. Another, a congregation of Amazons bolting with a vengeance. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was delighted. My dear friends, I see that all of the journals from Maine to Texas strive with each other to see which can make our movement seem more ridiculous. Imagine all the publicity given to our ideas. It will start women thinking, and men too. And when men and women think, the first step in progress is taken. Okay, so this gives you a sense of the flavor of this conference. What I want to do is to provide a little bit of background about how those couple of hundred people came to be there. Take a look at the classic document, the Declaration of Sentiments and Resolutions, and hopefully in the question and answer session have a lively discussion of how we might relate to this document today, and for those of you who are teachers, how you might teach this document. As I mentioned, the Seneca Falls Convention is organized in the space of about 10 days by five women. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Coffin Mott, Martha Coffin Wright, Mary Ann McClintock, and Jane Hunt. These women are all active in abolitionist circles, and some have been active in temperance circles as well. So what's happening or what you see in that chapel is the result of decades of mobilization, and I want to talk about that um, for a few moments. Understanding these pathways is key to understanding the language of the Declaration of Sentiments. 19th century American women began to find a voice in reform movements that centered on anti-prostitution and temperance. And to understand these reform movements, you have to understand something about the 19th century cult of domesticity. Historians sometimes call this the cult of true womanhood. This cult of domesticity, on the one hand, was very conservative. It assumed that women had a place in the home, that they were the guardians of the home, that they were pious, pure, and should be obedient to their husbands. However, women selectively related to this cult of true womanhood. Many rejected the concept of obedience while embracing the concept of piety. If women were the most pious, if women were the guardians of the home, perhaps when there were threats to the home, they should be the ones who took on reform activity. So when we think about temperance, temperance comes out of a religious sensibility. Temperance comes out of a concern with guarding the home. But temperance also brings women into the public sphere. And so when we look at these movements, and I'll be looking at three, temperance, anti-prostitution, and abolition, they all involve a movement for women 
out of private reform, reform focusing mainly on the home, to reform focusing on the public sphere. Alcohol abuse was a major issue in the 19th century, and women were drawn to the temperance cause. There were male temperance societies as well, and women first became active as auxiliary members of male societies. However, they soon began to form societies of their own. When we think about the female moral imagination, in the 19th century, it is drawn primordially to temperance. Why is this the case? I think if we look at some of the effects of alcohol abuse on the family, it's pretty easy to see. The cult of true womanhood or cult of domesticity assumed a cult of masculinity as well, that if the woman safeguarded the home, the man provided economic support, protection, etc. Well, if that support went to the saloon, if the man abandoned his family for alcohol, what was the woman to do? If that alcoholism was linked to abuse, where was her protection? Where were her legal rights to work outside the home, to gain an education, even to gain custody of her own property or her own children? And as you see in the film, women had none of those rights in the 19th century. So the alcoholic's wife for the temperance activists was a kind of limit case of the powerlessness of woman. If we think about the qualities associated with being a good citizen in a democracy, and using your reason is key among them, the alcoholic man had given up his reason, had abandoned his family responsibility, yet he had legal protection, he had legal rights that his wife did not have. So not surprisingly, many temperance activists began to look at the legal status of women. When women cannot have custody of their own children, what is to be done? Well, what is to be done is that the law must be changed. So what begins as a private matter, a matter having to do with the politics of the home, soon migrates to the public sphere as well. If we think about domestic abuse, many historians identify the temperance movement as the first movement that takes on this issue. When you think about this, from a contemporary perspective, people ask why. We have movements today against domestic abuse that don't mention alcohol, and one can have a violent home without the presence of alcohol. However, go back to the 19th century, talking about alcohol may have been a kind of buffer, that dealing with violence in the home was a controversial, challenging issue, and many historians agree that it may have been easier to talk about alcohol as the cause rather than to deal with the violence head on. So temperance engaged the moral energy of female reformers in the 19th century. Likewise, that moral energy also was expressed in anti-prostitution campaigns. When you look at the rise of prostitution in the 19th century, you have to think about two processes. One is the process of industrialization. The second is the process of migration, immigration as well that as women are moving into cities, are moving away from familiar networks, they may find themselves without work, they may find themselves without training, and they may find job opportunities in prostitution. For anti-prostitution activists, the assumption was, and I think this is a controversial one today as well, that if women had any other choice, they would not choose prostitution. So for them, prostitution is a symbol of the powerlessness of women. We could debate whether, in fact, this is true. And there are some prostitutes in the 19th century, as well as today, who would challenge that assertion. But in the 19th century, the assumption was that if a woman chose, quote unquote, prostitution, that meant she had no other opportunities. That was the sum of a series of a lack of choices or a series of oppressions. So it's easy to see female moral energy beginning in the home, Protect your home, guard against alcohol abuse, guard against prostitution, but that takes you out of the home into the public sphere as well. How do you guard against prostitution? Some advocates would say provide women with more protection legally, provide women with more opportunity. When we look at the language, and we will a little bit later, of the Declaration of Sentiments, you can see the influence of both the temperance campaign and the anti-prostitution campaign in the language of that document. Yet most immediately, it's abolition, as you saw from the film, that seeds the growth of the American women's rights movement. 
and influences the language of the Declaration of Sentiments very strongly. Historian Bettina Apfecker characterizes a kind of synergy between abolitionism and feminism, what she calls a revolutionary moment in which each movement pushes against the other's boundaries, um, crosses each other's barriers. In Apfecker's words, quote, the female presence helped to shape the revolutionary character of abolition and a practical engagement in the struggle against slavery impelled a consciousness of a distinctly feminist vision. Women were the foot soldiers of the abolitionist cause. They petitioned, they did fundraising, and they also opened their homes in the Underground Railroad. If you think about that last fact, what did it mean to open your home as part of the Underground Railroad? How did you put yourself at risk? How did you put your family at risk? How did you put those escaping slaves at risk if you did not safeguard them properly? You could be at this highest level of engagement with abolition, but it could seem very private. At the same time, you could be told when you attended an abolitionist meeting that you're not expected to speak. You're female. The speaking role is open to men. So when we think about abolition, in a way, it's the perfect staging area for the women's rights movement, for Seneca Falls to happen. What happens in abolition is women gain a great deal of practical political experience fundraising, petitioning. But speaking is quite controversial. When the Grimke sisters, Angelina and Sarah Grimke from South Carolina, very famous abolitionists, go out to speak, sometimes they are pelted with vegetables. They're told that it's not their role. Women experience what might be called a kind of relative deprivation. Their husbands, fathers, sons, and brothers are encouraged to speak out in the abolitionist movement, but they are not. The concept of relative deprivation is in contrast to the concept of absolute deprivation. Absolute deprivation, the point of being most deprived. A lot of people assume that's when a social movement emerges. But often a movement emerges when people feel relatively deprived. Those in their family circle have rights, property rights, custody rights, speaking rights within a movement that they do not have. A lot of female abolitionists have a keen sense of what they could do if only they had the right to do it, if only they had the power to do it. So again, abolition is a kind of prime staging area for women's rights. It provided a comparison group, women with slaves, both male and female. The racism-sexism analogy seemed logical. If one form of oppression was unjust, if it could not be justified, how could you justify another? So in a lot of ways, abolition as a parallel human rights movement is, some might say, a kind of inevitable staging area for feminism. <coughs> that women are gaining skills, they're gaining a sense of themselves as powerful, but they are being denied that power at the same time. There's a concept within sociology called resource mobilization. It simply means that if you want to start a social movement or maintain a social movement, you need resources. Those might be financial, those might be organizing, those might be psychological. And abolition certainly provides women with the resources that they need to begin a movement. In comparison to temperance and anti-prostitution activism, abolition is the closest in structure to what a women's movement will be. There are also some critical events that help to seed what happens at Seneca Falls. At the World Anti-Slavery Convention in 1840, women are asked to sit behind a curtain. Kind of an extreme uh, example of powerlessness. Some men sit with them in a show of solidarity and some do not. So at that convention is also raised the question of the role of men in a women's rights movement. Is such a movement for women only or for their male advocates as well? If you look at Seneca Falls, this is a conference of men and women. And some of the men at Seneca Falls were also present at the World Anti-Slavery Convention. Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton meet at that convention and conclude, and this is eight years before Seneca Falls, that it is time for a separate women's movement, that the time has come, the time has arrived, and it is up to them and their colleagues to begin that movement, which they do in 1848. Now, if you think about those couple of weeks and five women who are organizing, Basically what they're doing is they're drawing upon a local network 
that has been active already in temperance, anti-prostitution, and especially in abolition. They're drawing from a Quaker network, and they're drawing from the towns around Seneca Falls. So Seneca Falls is really a local convention in many ways. The 300 people who attend, if you look through the list, and you can find the list if you go to the Seneca Falls National Historical Park site, you can Google some of those people and you'll find that they show up again and again in women's rights activism in the 19th and into the early 20th century. Some others are lost to history after that point. They go to this local conference or convention, they're active in their local communities, they aren't necessarily national activists. And I think that's one of the things that makes this conference very, very interesting. It's really about a local area. Seneca Falls is a hotbed of activism. It's easily ignited. One of the meetings, which is called the Junius Quaker Meeting in Waterloo, New York, in the area, recently formed a progressive Quaker coalition. And it's that coalition that comes to Seneca Falls as well. So these are networks that are already organized, that are basically waiting and ready to go with the right invitation. And these women provide that. Now, when we look at Elizabeth Cady Stanton in organizing this convention, she didn't only want to get a few hundred people together for a few days, express a sense of women's indignation or injustice. She also wanted to leave a document that would remain as a classic in history. So if you think of why we're here today, we're here today to talk about this document. It's exactly what she wanted. There are many other women's rights documents of the 19th and early 20th century that are well written, persuasive and convincing, but do not make it into state history standards or do not make it uh, into the uh, genre of classic text. So she accomplished what she set out to do and she decides to model the Declaration of Sentiments on the Declaration of Independence. So the first thing I want to do is to talk about this choice for a few moments and hopefully in the question and answer period we'll have a chance to discuss this a little more as well. Now here she is, she's organizing this conference. She is the major author of the document, the founding document that will come out of it. What is it going to look like? And she looks at a lot of different political manifestos and decides the Declaration of Independence is the best choice. And this is what she says about her choice. That the others, quote, seem too tame and pacific for the inauguration of a rebellion such as the world had never before seen. So clearly, um, she is thinking of this moment as a very important historical moment, and she wants to mark it with a document. She's following on a reform tradition. Historian Pauline Mayer, in her book American Scripture, describes what she calls the sacralization of the Declaration of Independence. And this is to quote from Mayer. After the 1820s, workers, farmers, women's rights advocates, and other groups continually used the Declaration of Independence to justify their quest for equality. So that Stanton is not the only person doing this. What's interesting, though, is that not all of those other alternative declarations of independence make it into history in the way this has. And we can, we can talk about that as well. Um, Stanton decides to um, read this aloud at the Seneca Falls Convention. Then it is published uh, by Frederick Douglass, who is represented in the film. Um, first and then published in various other versions, sold at women's rights conventions that followed, and generally becomes a classic document after this period. It's interesting to note that she calls it the Declaration of Sentiments and Resolutions and not the Declaration of Female Independence. So when we think about this, if she had called it the Declaration of Female Independence, clearly there might have been people who had found that too radical, too incendiary, and finished reading at that point. Think about Declaration of Sentiments, sentiments, feelings, emotions. You want to read on. You want to see what those sentiments are. Now, when you read it, at first hearing, it sounds almost as if you are listening to the Declaration of Independence. This is a revered document that is typically read every July 4th. So let's think about the timing of Seneca Falls, July 18th to 20th. A few weeks after, classic celebrations of the 4th of July in which that document would have been read aloud. 
On the one hand, Stanton's text evokes an identification with the Declaration of Independence, an identification with the patriotism of the founding document, and a sense of a democratic ethos. On the other hand, though, it seems like a correction. It seems like the revised version. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal. Perhaps the American Revolution was incomplete, the new document suggests. Perhaps this is the version that should have been created, but wasn't. Perhaps this is the version that should be read after this point in time. So I think it has a very complex relationship to the Declaration of Independence. On the one hand, it's paying homage. It's saying, this is a sacred document. There is a set of beliefs here about human rights, dignity, and democracy that we are embracing. But that document didn't go far enough. We're going to push it further. One historian remarked that it's taking the promise of the original document and making it real. And so that complex relationship paying homage on the one hand, but criticizing on the other. The Declaration of Sentiments, and if you have it in front of you, you can take a look at it, you'll notice that it maintains the he structure of the Declaration of Independence. Now, in the Declaration of Independence, it's clear who he is, King George and the British system against which the colonies are rebelling and are declaring an end to a, to a colonial system. Are women a colony? That's the question the Declaration of Sentiments is asking. Are men or male-dominated institutions like King George or like an imperial ruler? Few Americans would want to see themselves in this way. And I think it's interesting to think about the encounter with the reader in 1848, obviously much closer to the American Revolution than we are today. How does that reader want to think of himself or herself? If you don't agree that women should be given full human rights. Are you like an imperial power? Are you like Great Britain? That's the question that's being asked. We think about the rhetorical effect of that he. He can be read as all men, but he can be also read as a set of attitudes, a set of attitudes that both men and women could hold. He can be read as patriarchal institutions, law, medicine, various professions that exclude women, but not necessarily all men. If you try to interpret the he of the Declaration of Sentiments, you have to think about the fact that 32 men signed the document. So if you take the he, and then you look at the signers, which include uh, Frederick Douglass, James Mott, and many other less well-known men, what are those men doing? They may be saying there's an alternative definition of masculinity that masculinity can have different meanings. It can have a patriarchal meaning. It can have an egalitarian meaning. It's your choice whether you sign in or you sign out. So I think when you look at the document, particularly for those of you who teach the document, if you look at the signers and you look at the he, you have to think about the relationship between the two. Who is the he? This is a pretty complicated question. This is a document that is an eclectic document. It's a document that describes a far-reaching agenda of social change. And if you look at the sentiments, they span laws, morals, customs. It's quite a reform agenda. On the one hand, it's a kind of inventory of oppression. It's a proof that the women's movement is necessary, in the same way that the Declaration of Independence is a proof that the American Revolution was necessary that it was necessary to form a new nation. If you look at those injustices together, the weight of them provides justification for social change. But if you look at them separately, you can also choose agenda items that you want to be involved with. So in many ways, it's a very practical document. Let's say you are an activist in 1848. You don't want to take on the whole system. But you want to change marriage laws or you want women to get into college, or you want other kinds of property reform for women, then you can choose part of the document, but not the entire change agenda. If we look at the order of the sentiments, the franchise, the vote, appears first. And it's interesting, as you saw in the film, that this is the most radical demand of the conference. And it is very difficult to get this passed. In the contemporary period, it's hard for us to understand that voting doesn't appear to be particularly radical. 
What I think you have to remember in this period is that the vote symbolizes an entire system. The vote symbolizes a set of assumptions about what women are and what they can do in the world. So it's not just about casting a ballot. It's something much larger than that. If you look on in the document, you'll see that the next set of sentiments are about marriage, right? And this is number eight, if you have the copy. He has made her, if married, in the eye of the law, civilly dead. Some of the strongest language in the Declaration of Sentiments. If we think about marriage, the word death doesn't usually immediately follow. Marriage as civil death. What Stanton is doing here is introducing a language that will shock, introducing a metaphor that's at odds with the dominant metaphor of marriage, which is that marriage is about love and protection. I'm saying, let's look at it another way. It's about death. What's it the death of? It's the death of the independent self, the death of a self that could earn wages and hold property. And it's the death of one's custody rights. And so if we think about this very radical language, it's interesting to note that in 1848, there is already a very active movement to change the laws around the rights of married women. In fact, in 1848, New York State passes uh, a somewhat conservative but, but still important uh, Marriage Reform Act. And by 1860, a number of states will pass Marriage Reform Act. So it's not surprising that some of the most radical language is attached to campaigns that are ongoing. And it is intended to shock. Do you think of marriage as civil death? Probably most people don't think of it in that way. But the document is meant uh, to shock. The document brings up the idea of what's called couverture, English common law, that the identity of a wife is covered by her husband. The custom of a woman taking her husband's name upon marriage, Mary Smith marries John Jones and becomes Mrs. John Jones. This is uh, rooted in couverture, the idea that after she is married, she no longer has an independent identity, that she is part of his identity. And this is what Stanton is trying to highlight in this document. It's not surprising if you look at the number of people who signed the Declaration of Sentiments that some of them are involved in the 1850s in egalitarian marriage ceremonies. So some of them will craft ceremonies that say the husband has no right to expect obedience from the wife, the husband has no right to the right over his wife's property or custody of his children. Uh, the most famous one is in 1855, uh, Lucy Stone and Henry Blackwell. Uh, Lucy Stone keeps her own name after marriage, indicating marriage by being Mrs. Lucy Stone. Uh, Blackwell says the laws uh, of marriage are unjust and basically contends that any man who believes in gender equality needs to sign himself out of those laws. So if you look at the Declaration of Sentiments, part of what's happening is that there's a kind of forecasting of some of the political activity that will be happening in the period right after Seneca Falls. And these alternative marriage ceremonies, uh, some of them are happening before uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, when she married, marries in 1840, uh, will not uh, agree to obey her husband. She includes her birth name, Katie, in her married name. Henry Stanton, by the way, does not attend Seneca Falls. He thinks it's an embarrassment because his wife is encouraging women to vote. Um, so he is not one of those men who signs. Um, but the point here is that what you're seeing in this document is an agenda of change um, to which these people are personally committed as well as publicly committed. So in the 1850s, you will see a number of alternative marriage ceremonies in which the ideas of the Declaration of Sentiments are put into practice. We also see uh, some hyperbole or exaggeration in the text. Uh, we see the Declaration of Sentiments asserting the right of women to education and to equality in work in the professions. Uh, and the statement is made that all colleges are, are closed to women. Uh, Oberlin College is admitting women at this point. So that not everything in the Declaration of Sent Sentiments is absolutely factually true. Uh, one of the things that you need to recognize when you look at a document like this is that it uses hyperbole, it uses exaggeration as a way of dramatizing a system. So if you're teaching the document, 
uh, you have to teach students to, to look at that and realize that not everything is absolutely true. The exclusion of women from religious power and participation is also highlighted in the Declaration of Sentiments. And this is a really important point. The Declaration of Independence, remember, guarantees human rights as God-given. The Declaration of Sentiments extends those rights to women. So God is defined in many ways as either a gender-neutral character who is affirming gender equality or as an equal rights man, a man who supports women's rights. So the idea of women's equality in religion is very important in this document. We also see the anti-prostitution and temperance language in the idea of different moral codes. Just to read to you from 15, moral delinquencies which exclude women from society are not only tolerated but deemed of little account in man. So what are these moral delinquencies? They might be for women in unwed pregnancy uh, or they might be an arrest for prostitution in which a male customer goes free and the woman is brought to jail. Or the unwed father is unnamed and the unwed mother is shamed in her society. We also see in 17, and this is the uh, sentiment that my students often find most interesting, he has endeavored in every way that he could to destroy her confidence in her own powers, to lessen her self-respect, and to make her willing to lead a dependent and abject life. This is called by some the self-esteem sentiment. Many readers find this surprising since they, it seems quite modern, yet this emphasis on self-esteem is very much part of 19th century politics as well. Stanton was stressing the fact that many women were not all that they could be, that they were living up to low expectations that others had of them, and the oppression they're describing, or she's describing in the document, is an oppression that is psychological as well as legal. That's an oppression that is not only external, but internal as well. Uh, this is a sentiment that can't be quantified. If you look at the sentiments, you can count how many women are in various professions at this point, or how many colleges admit women, or what laws exist to protect women. Can you measure self-esteem? Not as easily. So this, in many ways, is a risky sentiment. But it strengthens the document in other ways. It says that what we have here is a gender system that operates on a number of levels. It operates on the cultural and social level, the legal level, the psychological level, the economic level. If we look at this document, you'll see that the sentiments are followed by the resolutions. Uh, I won't go into the resolutions in detail, but we'll say that if one only had the sentiments, you could be left with a sense of the weight of oppression. That what Stanton is trying to do is to say that as you read this enumeration, in the same way as you read the enumeration in the Declaration of Independence, this should stimulate you not to paralysis and depression, but to optimism and activism. And that is, in essence, what the resolutions are about. To be clear that we're enumerating these oppressions, not simply uh, to give you a sense of the impossible, but to present a social change agenda and to commit to that agenda. So if you think about that conference, what people are committing to is not only the sense of this is how the system works, by law, by custom, by psychology, by economics, but we are also going to change it. Collectively, we are going to change it. So, if you think about this document, it's a very complex, rich, and multi-layered document. I've taught it for a long time, and I always find new meanings in it. So for those of you who are studying it in classes, uh, reading it independently, or teaching it, it is amazingly rich. It's rich in its time, and it's rich with relevance um, for the present. The document sets out a social change agenda. It tells the reader that the writer anticipates backlash and ridicule, and it affirms the moral energy of the movement. If you look at the legacy of temperance, anti-prostitution and abolition, and the language of those movements, the language of moral reform, the language of justice and abolition, you can see that migrating into the Declaration of Sentiments. A husband is at one point called a master 
right? And clearly the migration of that language from abolition. So not surprisingly, five women organized a conference in 10 days that would leave us with a document that remains classic today. I want to, um, as I'm concluding, talk a little bit about how the Declaration of Sentiments is looking forward as well as backward to the 19th century reform movements. If you look at the concept of gender and power in the Declaration of Sentiments, you can see a concept that's later articulated by 20th century feminist scholars in sociology and psychology and political science. Looking at the sentiments together, you see a system in operation. The system is not upheld by biologically determined gender roles, but by a set of mutually reinforcing attitudes and institutions that set barriers on women, oppress them, constrain their political voice, and prescribe limited roles for them in the world. If you think about modern day women's and gender studies and the perspective of gender as a system, a system that operates on a variety of different levels, in many ways, the Declaration of Sentiments foreshadows that conception. And that conception also says that it's not an airtight system. It's a system with holes and leaks and contradictions, and the system can often be changed by identifying its component parts, whether those parts be the law, culture, psychology, or religion. And if you think about the Declaration of Sentiments in 1848, and you think about Stanton's aim, her aim was very much to do what we are doing today, to leave a document that is rich, complex, that looks back to the past of the American Revolution and the female reform movements, but also looks ahead to a sophisticated sense of gender as a system that operates at various levels, but can be changed through concerted effort. So I look forward to questions and comments I think that I like to describe this document as one that can be mined. It's very rich, it's very complicated, and its meanings can be read in a, in a variety of ways. And I guess the, the last thing I want to say about it is that uh, Stanton trusted the intelligence of those who read the document. She didn't give us an easy document or a document that has all the answers, uh, a document that is pre-interpreted. Some of the document is difficult to interpret. What does she mean by this sentiment? What does she mean by that? And perhaps that's one of the most important lessons of this document, that not only does it build upon the classic Declaration of Independence, but it also trusts its readers uh, to find enduring meaning within it. So thank you, and questions, comments? <laughs> Yeah. How do we start ourselves in the Well, if you were in the 19th century, it would mean um, being at odds with the law as it existed. In the contemporary period, those laws have changed. So that essentially, if marriage customs are patriarchal, essentially in the, in the present era, it's about psychological change. Um, but it's not about legal change. So it's interesting that. If you look at some of these sentiments today, uh, clearly there are some marriages today that are not egalitarian or women don't have an equal voice. You say, what would be the pathway to change? The pathway to change might be more cultural, psychological, economic, um, but wouldn't necessarily be legal. But if we were having this conversation in 1848, the answer would be that first you need to guarantee women's legal rights as mothers, as wage earners, as property holders, as persons within, within marriage. Uh, at that point in time, it was illegal for a woman to have her birth name after marriage. Today, that is no longer true. Okay, um, someone else? Yeah, yeah. 
That's an interesting question, and, um, and let me address that. Uh, in the contemporary period in gender studies, uh, one of the areas, and in fact, one of the reasons why women's studies programs have often changed to being women's and gender studies programs is the notion that not everyone is male or female. There are people who are born intersex with qualities of both sexes, uh, and there are people who psychologically um, or culturally may not want to identify as male or female. Um, when you look at this document, is this implied in that document? Uh, some people would say yes, that uh, there certainly is a sense of gender as flexible, as not constraining. I don't think Katie Stanton was thinking of that in 1848. However, I think that um, there are potentially some implicit meanings in which you can say, um, well, gender may be more flexibly uh, defined than uh, male and female, even on the biological level, right? Okay, the other question about language, that this is a document that's all about language and explicitly says men and women, but certainly you can read mankind as implying men and women, and so there's an active debate currently about language, what I call language in the gendered order. You know, do you always need to say he and she? if you are implying um, both sexes? And I think that's an, that's an open question. But one thing I would say about this document is that it raises the question of the importance of language. Importance of language. Marriage as civil death. You know, what could be harsher language than that? And then men and women. And at this point, Stanton is adding in women to say that originally women were not counted, uh, women were not considered but now we're putting them uh, at the forefront. And whether you need to do that in every sentence you construct, you know, people are, I'm sure many of you are writing papers and making those decisions. So what I term an everyday justice decision. Do you need to say, you know, he, she, can you say mankind, et cetera. Um, someone else who hasn't spoken? Other questions? Yeah. That's a huge question. Have women, the question is, have women always been powerless in societies, and if so, why? Um, I think we will never know, and we cannot know, the, uh, the first days of human prehistory. That is unknowable. So in some ways, this is an unanswerable question. Are there vulnerabilities that women have had historically that men have not? Yes. Uh, I would say the primary vulnerabilities are uh, dangerous childbearing, uh, dangerous environments, generally. Uh, lifespans that did not extend beyond reproductive lifespan, right? Uh, and I think that these factors make women vulnerable. Powerless, I would say that may be extreme. I think even in societies where women are not equal, um, they may have some power, but the power may be connected with traditional roles. Um, there are also societies with matrilineal, forms of descent, the Iroquois, for instance. So this is a very huge question, and I think it's an important one. I think it's also one of those questions that is almost impossible to answer. I think what's easier to answer are, what are the conditions that promote female equality? And I think the conditions are economic opportunity, um, ability to uh, regulate and control reproduction, uh, longer lifespans, uh, educational opportunity, political opportunity, uh, all of those things. I think it's easier to look at the preconditions for equality than to absolutely say, you know, what is the prime cause for women's disempowerment? Um, I also would encourage, uh, sometimes people think there may have been a golden age, you know, in which women were empowered and then they were uh, somehow uh, taken down from power. And I don't think that's a reasonable reading of history. Uh, I don't think. Uh, I don't think there are golden ages, first of all, and I also think that um, women's statuses in societies go up and down uh, according to various factors. You know, if we look at the United States during World War II, women's status improves when men go off to war uh, during 
1942 to 45, declines again when men return and they are demobilized. And so I think uh, looking at that narrative is, is often more productive. But I, I appreciate your question. It's an important question. Um, someone else? Yeah. Yes, yes. I also think that the self-esteem sentiment is linked to other sentiments in the document. For example, uh, improving women's opportunity for higher education, improving women's opportunity uh, in the professions, improving women's participation in, in religion. So I think um, that self-esteem doesn't stand alone. It's interesting that it's at the end. And some people criticize Stanton and say, why didn't she just stay with the material changes she wanted to see. Changes in law, admission to work, admission to the professions, and self-esteem is too fuzzy. So that's a criticism of the document. On the other hand, there are those who would say that it's a, it's a kind of radical move to say that systems operate on the level of psychology as well as the law. But do I think there have been improvements in female self-esteem? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Larger set of questions around marriage, yeah. Uh, I think in the contemporary period, um, the assumption of who pays the price may have changed somewhat. Uh, I think uh, if we look at the period in which uh, Stanton is writing Declaration of Sentiments, it's interesting that um, the rates of parent-controlled marriages have gone down. So that's kind of interesting in that, in that period. But you're raising a much wider set of issues uh, around marriage. Okay, other questions or comments? Yeah? Well, I, um, an observation, a comment, and a question. The, uh, my observation was the Declaration of Independence is also full of hyperbole. Yes, absolutely. And watching the news a couple of weeks ago with, in Egypt and the celebrations in the street, and you could actually see the antagonism between the men and the women. Women mm -hmm. saying, we're going to create a new government, we're going to mm -hmm. have equality, mm -hmm. and you could see the men uh, mm -hmm. wanting that. So I'm just wondering if the Declaration of Independence, with its the right to govern, it comes from the consent of the governed. Maybe the Declaration of Sentiments will follow the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a hope. Mm -hmm. um, my question was, you, you, you've got the first wave of feminism. So are you expecting another wave, maybe a tsunami? Or <laughs> <laughs> well, if we think about you know the second wave, most people date to 1963 publication of Feminine Mystique, or 1966 with the formation of the National Organization for Women. I think that the, um, you brought up something interesting, which is the metaphor of waves. Metaphor of waves assumes that you have uh, a great swelling of activity, followed by a period of quiescence, followed by a swelling of activity. And that may be a simplification of history. If you look at, and this is really beyond this talk, but the period after the vote, 1920, to let's say 1965, there certainly is activity on behalf of women's empowerment, even though it may not be called the women's rights movement. So most people date the second wave to 63 or 66. There's a contemporary debate about whether the second wave is still going on or whether the second wave declined somewhat and now we have possibly a, a third wave. Uh, but I also encourage you, when you think about social movements, they're very complicated. Sometimes they're visible, as in, Suffrage March, Seneca Falls Convention, sometimes they're not that visible. They may be a change in someone's attitude or the reading of a book uh, or the entry into a profession that has been previously designated as male. So uh, there's a um, political scientist, Mary uh, Katzenstein, who has uh, a concept that may be useful called unobtrusive mobilization. And what she says is often in periods that aren't designated as feminist, if you look behind the scenes, there's a lot of women's activity. It's not the kind that finds itself on the pages or the front page of the New York Times, necessarily. Um, your other question, and this referred to Egypt, I think, was whether you might get independence uh, for a country first, followed by women's empowerment. 
And there certainly is an argument that social justice movements tend to be sequential, that you have the American Revolution, you have abolition, you have women's rights, later on you have civil rights and then women's rights, and that they build on one another. And certainly we have a lot of historical examples of that. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's called cool Coverture. It's spelled in a couple different ways. The most common is uh, C-O-V-E-R-T-U-R-E. -E. It's from English common law, and the idea is that the woman is covered and protected under the identity of the husband. So if you think about that language of protection, it assumes a kind of ideal marriage in which uh, the husband is able to, to protect the wife. Obviously, some of the temperance activists may have agreed with Coverture in principle, but didn't see it happening in reality. And then at Seneca Falls, you have people who don't agree with it in principle either. But it's the idea of being covered or being protected or losing one's independent identity. It's also called in the French couverture, sometimes adding a U before, before the V. Yeah? How come um, the Nazis paid less than men? How come women are paid less than men, is your question? Um, in the US, on average, um, full-time woman worker earns 80 cents to the male dollar. Um, this doesn't mean that women are always paid less than men. Um, there are situations in which women are paid equally or women are paid more. There are a few recent studies in which women in their 20s are actually earning more than their male counterparts. So I think um, when you look at that statement, you have to qualify it a little bit. Uh, I think there are a lot of reasons for it. Um, one may be overt discrimination, uh, one may be um, the socialization of women away from certain highly paid professions. You look at fields like physics or computer science, you find far fewer women than in a field of biology. Uh, do we assume that women are untalented in these areas? There are, there are many talented women in these areas. Do we assume that women may be socialized away from these areas, that they are seen as unfeminine? Um, yes, I think that's an important question. We also have to look at the fact that childcare is inadequate, often parental leave is inadequate, and uh, key earning years are years in which um, women are often taken up with the dual responsibilities of working and, and family. So I think my um, simple answer to this is that it's very complex, there, there's no one, one answer, but I think there are a set of factors that, uh, that contribute to the wage gap. The wage gap is also closing, um, but probably more slowly than Elizabeth Cady Stanton would have liked. You know, so if you think of you know, 1848, what would someone like Stanton have predicted if the legal changes that she was advocating happened would probably predict that no one would be asking your question because it would be a question rooted in previous history. But it's not. And that's, I think, what makes this document interesting, that it is still relevant, although the drafter of the document thought that it probably uh, would not be after a time or its specific sentiments would not be. Yeah? Um, much of the discussion of the history has been very um, American. Mm -hmm. What was going on in the rest of the world? A lot of things. I mean, I don't have time to talk about them all. But um, in terms of the American movement, the most influential movement uh, was the British movement. And there certainly is, and particularly as suffrage goes on, there is a lot of connection between the American movement and the, and the British movement. Um, we also see activity in, in France. Um, we see in the contemporary period, if you, if you are teaching this document, it's very interesting to look at the legal status of women in a variety of societies and compare it, compare it against this. So um, if you think about the Declaration of Sentiments, it uh, is circulated in Great Britain uh, at the time it is, it is written. Um, I don't know when it is first translated. It's kind of an interesting, interesting question. Okay, somebody who hasn't spoken? Anybody who teaches this document? Yeah? Sure. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. There's a huge debate in the field of history about how to talk about social movements and what social movements look like. And I think um, the language of waves, while it's interesting, is, has problems, has problems. So I would encourage each of you, if you think about a social movement, this doesn't only have to be the women's rights movement, if there is a, a metaphor or a piece of language that would try to capture it for you, and when you do that, you always have to think about what works for that language and what doesn't. The women's rights movement is a peaceful movement, so warlike language may connote energy, but may provide other connotations that you don't want. The language of waves may have the problems that you suggest. So I think that language is not always adequate to what we are describing, and it's our a challenge to look at what movements are, uh, what forms they take. I think the women's movement takes uh, some unusual forms, say in the second wave, or consciousness raising groups, uh, a form that we don't see in other social movements. Uh, and we have to think about how you would describe it given the range of forms. The forms may be predictable, conferences and organizational meetings, and they may be less predictable as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but was not accorded the title mm -hmm. mm -hmm. until she received her second Nobel. Mm -hmm. And uh, even today, she is the only person who singularly has been accorded in her own right, in her own field, a Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. And now we don't often discuss that. I think that that's a PR ploy that uh, we don't use sufficiently. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting point that I think um, if you look at women, the movement of women into the professions, often the earliest pioneers have experiences like this, or sometimes women later have experiences like this. And then the, uh, the winning of prizes or the kind of stamping of social approval, I think, is, is important. So if you look at, if you take the Declaration of Sentiments and you think about any of the professions that women are not allowed into in 1848, and you look at what the pathway is, of entry and recognition. I think it's very interesting. And there are a lot of individual stories. You know, this is, Seneca Falls is a collective story. Declaration of Sentiments is a collective document. But you're right, there are many individual stories also that contribute uh, to a movement. And stories within professions tend to be documented less as part of a movement than stories within political organizations. So there are a lot of quiet stories within professions that were or continue to be male dominated. Okay, any other questions, comments? I want to make a couple comments about teaching the document in case some of you do. Um, it's a document that is um, incredibly rich for uh, stimulating students to learn about primary research. So if you are teaching or you think about teaching the document, you can take a sentiment and send students out to see what was happening in the 1840s or 1850s. You can look at changes in individual lives that connect with the document and you can enrich students' understanding of it. You can also take the document and look at societies in the contemporary period, whether the US or other countries, to look at the status of women uh, and to think about if you were writing a global declaration of sentiments, what it would look like today, right? If, if the UN, there was a UN committee writing a declaration of sentiments, what it would look like today. So thank you. Oh, do you have a question? No, I was going to say one okay. Mm -hmm. How to produce solar cells, take the technology back to Africa, to the town, and then permit women to study at night when that's the only time they're permitted. Mm -hmm. Formerly it was in the dark, now with the solar collectors, they have light, mm -hmm. and the males don't the, dominate them during the daylight, don't dominate them in the artificial mm -hmm. light. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Okay, a barefoot college? Yes. Barefoot okay, college. great, great. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of international collaboration now that's, that's very interesting to look at. Thank you very much. Thank you.